Today, Philosophy Insights did some special editing of Jordan Peterson's lecture, and I hope you enjoy the content. We could do a little quick survey here. How many of you think you think in words? You can put up your hands. Do you think in words? Okay, so it looks like... What about pictures? How many of you think in pictures? Okay, so that's interesting. How many of you think... That's about half and half, by the way. Probably a fewer on the word side. How many of you think in pictures and words? Okay. And, and so, all right, so it was roughly a third in each category, but that's also something that I really haven't encountered any research on from the neuropsychological perspective. It's like, well, do you think in pictures or do you think in words? And, and is, is that actually a reliable distinction? I think I think in words most of the time, but I can think in pictures. Like if I'm trying to build something, I can think in pictures very almost instantaneously, but it isn't my natural mode of thinking. I'm hyperverbal, and so my natural mode of thinking is to think everything through in words. But I know my wife isn't like that. She thinks in images and then has to translate them into words. And so, anyways, Jung was very literate, and he could really think in words, but he could really think in images. Also, talking to my wife quite extensively, like her, the intensity of her visualization vastly exceeds mine. So, for example, if I close my eyes and I try to imagine the crowd in front of me, it's pretty low resolution and vague and, and not brilliantly colored and, and vivid, you know? It, it's, it's, it's like I'm seeing through a glass darkly, let's say. I can't bring images to mind with, that, with spectacular clarity, but my wife is very good at that, and Jung seemed to be absolutely a genius at that kind of thinking. And he had a lot of visionaries in his family history as well, so I don't know to what degree there's a hereditary component of that, and I don't know to what degree that's actually like a neurological specialization. I, I presume it would be associated with the trait openness dis distinguishes itself, differentiates itself into interest in ideas and interest in aesthetics. And my suspicion are, is that the people who are more interested in aesthetics are the visionary types, the ones that think in images. Anyways, Jung could really think in images, and he could imagine beings. And... I had a client once who was a lucid dreamer, and how many of you have had a lucid dream? So you know you're dreaming while, you, while you're, okay, many. That, that phenomena wasn't really even, even identified as a phenomena until the end of the 19th century. There was a book written about it that Freud tried to get his hands on, but couldn't, because it was a very rare book. And then there was a researcher about 30 years ago who started to study lucid dreams. But anyways, I had a client who was a lucid dreamer, and one of the things she could do was ask her dream characters what information they were trying to convey, and they would tell her. So that was very interesting. And one of the consequences of that was, and I don't have this story completely right in my memory, but it's close enough. She was afraid of a very large number of things. And in her dream, I think it was a gypsy standing by a wagon, told her that, if she was going to be successful in university, that she would have to visit a slaughterhouse. And that was something that was way beyond her capacity to tolerate. She was a vegetarian. She couldn't stand the sight of raw meat even. And so, and she was very oppressed and depressed and anxious because of the slaughterhouse nature of existence. And so her dream focused on that. And one of the consequences of that, because the slaughterhouse was out of the question as a clinical intervention. Um, I took her to an embalming, right? Because I asked her, I asked her what, what, what might be equivalent to that. And so she suggested that. And, you know, exposure therapy is a hallmark of clinical psychology, right? One of the things you do with people as a clinician is you find out what they're afraid of and you gradually and voluntarily expose them to that and that cures them. And that's associated with the hero myth, right? It's exactly the same thing. It's like, there's a dragon, and it's stopping you, because there's lots of dragons, most of them aren't stopping you. You can ignore them. You don't have to just go, you know, slash away at randomly. You're not supposed to be fighting dragons that aren't in your way. But if they are in your way, you can't ignore them, and then you decompose them into sub-dragons, and you have people, you know, take them on. And as they take them on, they dispense with the dragon, and they gain the power of the dragon. It's like a video game. Actually, a video game is like that. That's why people like the video games. Well, that's right, right? There's a reason that you absorb power when you overcome things when you play a video game. It's not like that's intrinsic to the video game structure. That's an archetypal idea. 
anyways, we went and saw an embalming, which was a very interesting experience and, and quite, quite useful for her because she knew what she could tolerate after that and it was a hell of a lot more than she thought she could tolerate and so that's very useful to know back to Jung he's a visionary thinker now, my client, I said she could lucid dream and she could ask her dream characters what they wanted and what they were trying to communicate to her so that was pretty interesting that happened spontaneously, it had nothing to do with me I mean, I'm interested in dreams and many of my clients are great dreamers, especially the creative ones, because I think it's a hallmark of creativity to have vivid dreams and to be able to remember them. But that was a faculty that was natural to her. Jung had this other client at one time, at one point, and she had a variety of fears, and she had this dream that she told me, and she was walking down a beach, and on the side of the beach, up a dune, a small dune, there was this old man with a snake, a big python, and there's a crowd around him and uh, she was walking by the snake handler and the snake and the crowd and she didn't want to have anything to do with them, he was sort of showing people this snake and she told me that dream and I thought, well you know, you probably need to go see that snake and so I relaxed her, quasi-hypnotic technique, and it's very straightforward Hyp hypnosis is generally nothing but pronounced relaxation Though you have to be susceptible to hypnosis to actually fall into a hypnotic trance as a consequence of being relaxed I just relaxed her I had her breathe deeply and pay attention to different parts of her body and just relax her muscles one by one essentially so that she could concentrate and then I told her we'd play with the dream a little bit it's a Jungian technique I said well so call the dream image to mind which she could do quite well I said okay so let's let's explore it it's like pretend it's like pretend play you know, if you're a kid and you're pretend playing, you don't exactly direct the game, right? You, you, you play the game, so it's partly your direction, obviously, because you're the player, but the thing also happens spontaneously, of its own accord. And you could think about that as a dialogue between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, in some sense. It's a developmental dialogue. It's not a fun game if you just direct it, it's only a fun game if you're inviting and something is welling up as a consequence. It's the same thing that happens when you're you're engaged in some kind of artistic or literary production if it's all top down you know, if you're forcing it then it's propaganda, it's empty what you want to sort of is put yourself in a receptive state of mind in an imaginative state of mind and it's sort of half you and half nature itself manifesting itself in your creative imagination and that was the sort of state that we were striving for and she I asked her when she was in relaxed, I said, well, what do you think about the snake handler? and she said, well, he's probably a charlatan and he's just there trying to impress the crowd and to show off and she was afraid to go up there because she thought people would push her towards the snake and she'd have to touch it and so there was a fear of the crowd issue going on there too and I said, well, just, look, go up there but do it under these conditions is that, you know, if, if people get pushy, what are you going to tell them? and so we, we figured out something, he said, look you just tell them that, you know, you want to look at the snake at your own pace and that you don't need any encouragement or help and it would be good if you were just left alone so that enabled her to defend herself so she was afraid that the crowd would push her to do something that she didn't want to do that was part of the theme of the dream so anyway she eventually climbed the dune in her imagination and went into the crowd and the crowd turned out to be quite welcoming and not hostile and not pushy which isn't what you'd expect right because the, you'd think the crowd would have ex reacted in accordance with her fears since it was her fantasy but that, that's the thing about fantasies, they have this autonomous quality but the, the crowd was welcoming and not hostile and it turned out that the snake handler wasn't a charlatan he was just an old guy who had this snake and he was out there just showing it to people because he thought it was a cool thing and, and, and that maybe it was good for people to come and look at a snake and so she got close enough to the snake to touch it and so so I'm telling you that because I want you to understand a bit more about what Jung was trying to do and so he wrote these books notebooks that haven't been published yet called the black books and the black books are the documentation of his experiments with his imagination and what he would do is daydream like, like a child daydreams he, he regained that faculty although I think with Jung it was a faculty that had never really disappeared and he had figures of imagination that came to him 
that he could speak with. And he spoke with these figures of imagination and documented that over a very long period of time. And that was originally, that was eventually distilled into a book called The Red Book, which was published about three or four years ago. And it was a book that Jung regarded as the central source from which all his inspiration emerged. It was sort of, the way it looks to me is that we embody a lot of information in our action, right? And our action has developed as a consequence of imitating other people. And not only the people, the people around us, but of course the people around us imitated the people who came before them, and those people imitated the people who came before them, and so on, so far back that it's as far back as you can go. And so you embody these patterns of behavior that are extremely informative, that you don't understand, that are a consequence of collective imitation across the centuries. And so then those patterns can become manifest as figures of the imagination. And those figures of imagination are the distillations of patterns of behavior. And so, as the distillations of patterns of behavior, they have content. And it's not you, that content. It's, you could even think about it as content that's evolved, although it's culturally transmitted. It's content that's evolved. And so these figures of the imagination can reveal the structure of reality to you. And that's what happened with Jung. And that's what he described in the Red Book. And that was what permeated his psychology, a psychology that was based on the presupposition that the fundamental archetypal structures of religious belief were not pathological, not deceitful, not protective in some delusional sense against the fear of death, but quite the contrary. The very stories that enabled us to move forward as confident human beings in the face of chaos itself. And it's conceivable, I think perhaps probable, that nothing more important conceptually happened in the 20th century than that. Because it was the first time post-enlightenment that a rapprochement between the intellect and the underlying religious archetypal substructure occurred. You have in the capacious intellect of Jung, and the same thing happened to some degree with Piaget, the religious domain and the factual domain were brought back together. And the fact of Jung's enduring and increasing popularity and influence, I would say, is a direct consequence of that.